Hey there, welcome to another episode of The Geomologist Presents. Today we got some call-ins and answers on our ongoing discussion with Jason Connerly and why he has trouble, if that's the right word, with historical games. So should a player put in the work or not? And does it matter if they do or not? I don't think so. I think you can still get yourself into the game. You don't have to study out a game or a period. Hey, if that for you, if that enhances the experience, great. If not, then it doesn't matter. The GM honestly should give you enough tools to enjoy and understand the context of what's going on and um, should answer any questions that you might have. We also got some call in, a call in from Joe Richter and I have an unboxing and a recap of our latest Twilight 2000 4th edition game. They did not fight the tank. Hey Trumba, Jason of the Rat Pack here. Just want to kind of respond to your questions on your previous show. And I think I misspoke my position quite a bit. So let me clarify because I probably threw you off track, which is solely my fault. I think the... So, Traveler, you asked what my perception of Traveler is, and that is an attempt at hard sci-fi with a pretty vanilla rule system. So that's my impression of Traveler. As far as the historical games and the other games, so the it isn't the lack of fantastical elements, and I and I didn't mean... I misspoke. I didn't mean Napoleonics with occult mixed in. I, I meant a fantasy world kind of informed by Napoleonics. And what's the difference, you ask? The difference is the need to do homework. And this is kind of the issue with Harn because Harn makes you feel like you have to do homework and learn the world. And I guess a dedicated player is going to try to learn the world in all these games. But the more there is to learn about the world or an historical game to study the period and really come up to speed on the period, the harder it is. Now, if we're playing a period I'm well-versed in, the Old West, for ex- the American Old West, for example, 19th century in the U.S., well, you know, I don't have to do research on that, really, so that's obviously not a problem. But Napoleonics, I'm a lot more iffy on. I'd have to go do a lot of research. Um, the Roman game, we're, you know, we're set, when we play Cthulhu. The problem with that was, not the problem, it was a fun game, but I still felt that I wasn't bringing what I should be to it because I hadn't researched the period as much as I probably should have. And it, But it feels like work to research these things. And I understand there are periods that you and other players are passionate about, and, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't play in those periods. I'm just saying if they're not periods that I'm passionate about, I'm less local less likely to vote for those games because I realize it's going to cause more homework on my part to get boned up on that period. And the same thing, like I say, with Harn, I have to get boned up on all the world lore. The same thing with Garantha. You have to get boned up on the world. Yeah, I know your Garantha is yours, but let's be honest. You have to get boned up on the world lore. And that is also pro- part of the problem with Seven Seas is because they stupidly don't use real world nations I don't know if they're scared of offending people or they wanted to twist things and they're, they don't just want to say alternate history like, you know, intelligent games do. That because they want to switch the names of these countries around, now you have to relearn all this fake history. And that's homework. And I don't want to do homework for a game. Hey, Jason, there's a lot to parse through in what you said. But I don't, I don't know. I mean, how do you approach, I guess, the question, like, what about, does it detract from the experience if you don't if you play in the Forgotten Realms and you don't know the whole history of the Forgotten Realms from when this king reigned in this place or how Waterdeep was founded or the migration of this particular peoples to this place? I don't think it does. And I mean, I guess it's unfortunate that some of these games that expect or the stereo, not stereotype, the feeling is his for historical accuracy, like Harn, that you have to know all these things. I guess the regular person wouldn't know those things anyway in the world, right? But I don't, 
So I don't think a player necessarily has to know these things. Really, you probably just got to know who is the lord that you owe fealty to and are you on their good side or not. <laughs> really, I think that's the extent of what you need to know in a medieval world. Um, are you, can you travel freely? Are you a surf or not? Right? I mean, what's your role in society? What does that mean? That's it. You don't need to know the history of the kings of Kande or, you know, who killed who in the succession crisis of 700. Right? It, it, you know, I don't think you need to know those facts or need to study it out. And I feel like a fantasy game, you know, it's emergent discovery. And the GM should know these things. And the GM should have an idea on what he's going to share with the players and what the players need to know. But the players shouldn't feel, and you shouldn't feel, that you have to know the history of Harn or the history of Northwestern Lithia, honestly. Just like you don't need to know the history of Waterdeep or the history of pick a fantasy world, Greyhawk. Or, you know, you don't need to know, you know, how the Scarlet Brotherhood started. Maybe you do, but does it change the way you play or what your player would know? Probably not. So I think uh, you can treat them as any other fantasy world. <clears throat> so I think your point about historically based game, whether it's Call of Cthulhu or other, is also interesting. I know that I had a call from Colin Green a while back who said he really enjoyed the Invictus game because he felt he learned some history. Um, but he didn't know what was going on necessarily historically other than, you know, we know Romans and maybe your conception of Romans is from History of the World Part 1 or from Spartacus or from Ben-Hur. I don't know. Um, and that's okay. I don't think... I really don't think you need to study these things out. You probably just need to, you know, ask, maybe ask questions to the GM. Like, what does my character know? What do I need to know? But don't feel like you need to know everything about the world. Okay, so I'm going to do an unboxing and then answer some other of Jason's questions, maybe. So I got this international priority mail from Matthew Sprang of Mongoose Publishing. I'm going to use my handy dandy anvil box cutter to open it. And rip and tear it. Easier. All right, it's a box. If I say travel on it, Jason, uh -oh, what does that mean? It is the Deep Night Revelation commemorative pack. And now I remember when I ordered it. So there was a call on. I guess through the Kickstarter of the Deep Night Revelation. And they said, hey, we have 50 more of these Deep Night Revelation commemorative packs. And I was like, oh, should I get it? Should I get it? And I said, yeah, screw it. I'm going to get it. This is actually something that I like to run. And I'm opening it up. It has like shrimp wrap around the box. Uh, it looks pretty cool. The box does. It's got like, it's interesting. It has like space scene on the top. The Deep Night Revelation patch in the middle, and then like a scene with stepped pyramids on the bottom, and a mine looking village, or looks like actually looks like uh, Tenochtitlan, or Teotihuacan actually, uh, that the Sun City, Moon City in, in Central Mexico. All right, so what does this have other than the cover? A lot of subsector mappy things. I guess if you were at the table, you would use these subsector maps to plot your way. It's got some cool pens that say Traveler on it. Cool pencils, actually. A pen that says Traveler on it. With a deep little Deep Night Revelation thingy. Dice. Dice are always cool. A dice set. So a six-sided dice set. What looks like the six being the Deep Night Revelation ship. A patch, which is going to go in a hat at some point in most more than likely, and uh, a thing of cards that has all these, I guess it's sort of like action cards in a way, that have, let me open this thing up, 
looks like the action cards are, you know, different stellar objects that you might encounter during your Deep Night Revelation experience. It's also shrink rapid. Yeah, it's like, uh, oh yeah, definitely. They're like cards that, I guess you would, if you go into a system, you roll, kind of pick a card, and that's what you see. So, uh, pretty, pretty cool little set. It's probably, I mean, honestly, I got it for the patch, not the pencils. Uh, the pen is kind of a neat thing, too, and I, these hex grid maps are kind of handy. So, and I always like dice. It's a nice commemorative box for traveling. So, I think, Jason, you had wanted me to describe to you a bit about Traveler. So you know what, I'm not gonna delve deeply. I'm just gonna read some highlights from the wiki because that's, and I'll put the wiki in the show notes because that's the most interesting thing. Um, all right, pause a second. Are you ready? Traveler is a science fiction role-playing game. It was first published in 77 by Mark Miller and Game Designers Workshop. And he designed it with Notables like Frank Chadwick, John Harshman, Lauren Weissman. Uh, their other editions have been published, the GURPS and D20 as well. So, in fact, there is like the original was in 77, then they had the Mega Traveler in 87, the New Era in 93, Mark Miller's Traveler in 96, GURPS Traveler in 98, Traveler D20 in 2002, GURPS Interstellar Wars in 2006. Traveler for Hero, which I do have in 2006 as well. Uh, in 2008, Mongoose Traveler started, and then Mark Miller tried to do a Traveler 5 version, which is very interesting, just not a lot of support for it, but it, it is definitely like a big, giant toolbox, and that might be part of the problem. In 2016, the second edition of Mongoose Traveler came out. So... Characters, really, the premise is characters' journey between star systems, engaging in exploration, ground and space battles, interstellar trading, hence the term space trucking. Characters are not defined by need to increase native skill and ability, but by achievements, discoveries, wealth, titles, political power. That would be pretty interesting. So there's some influence. I don't know if you've read these, but uh, Mark Miller has listed influences, like his little Appendix N, Dorsi by Gordon Dixon, The Cosmic Computer, by H. Beam Piper, Space Viking, also by H. Beam Piper, Envoy to the New to New Worlds by Keith Lamar, Red Chief's Peace by Keith Lamar and William Keith, Dumberest of Terra Saga, Hammer Slammers, which is kind of neat. Uh, there are definitely some other ones I would say. I would say uh, there seems to be an influence from Paul Anderson's um, Space series as well, his Empire series. But uh, the key features of the of the verse. Human-centric, but cosmopolitan. The core rules focus on human characters, but there is support for playing aliens. And there's not a lot of aliens, so it does fall to me in the realm of space opera because there's aliens you can trade with and not aliens that are trying to eat you. Space travel. Interstellar travel is through the use of faster-than-light travel, which is called jump drive. There's limited communication, so there's no, like... There's no, like, like in Star Trek, how you have, like, faster-than-light communication... There's no Ansible like in uh, the uh, that one series by Orson Scott Card. You know, the Ender, Ender's Game, all that. Um, so no subspace radio, right? So, which I think is cool. That really limits like the speed of information. So communication is limited to the speed of travel. So conflict resolution, planets fight internal wars, but commerce is a major driving force of the civilization. Sociologically, international society is socially stratified. There's rich and poor. There's nobility, barons, dukes, archdukes, emperor. Diversity within limits. So career options, ship design, subsector design, and decisions are made during character generation and limit and frame your reality. Morals and morality. People remain people and continue to show courage, wisdom, honesty, and justice along with the bad things like cowardice, deceit, and criminal behavior. I think, so historically, the premise of Traveler, and I'm recalling this from memory, is that this is in the far future, so you could say, I would say some 3,000 years in the future, I believe if from what I recall correctly, that the year would be like 5400 AD, you know, 
or the common era, I guess that's 5400 common era. And man has reached out to the stars from Terra. Way back, he encountered another, a star, another star fring race that also happened to be human. And they were part of this large uh, empire, which is called the First Imperium. There is a series of interstellar wars. Those are highlighted by the GURPS products. And somehow Terra defeated this empire, this first imperium, and created a second imperium, which was also called the Ramshackle Imperium, because it did not last long. And when it collapsed, it created a period of long night where there was no interstellar trade. The current uh, political entity in human space is called the Third Imperium. And it is a little over a thousand years old and it's expanded not very far. I think that to me is a fascinating thing about Traveler is that it, the distances are, yes, vast in comparison to an individual person, but so small when you look at the galaxy as a whole. And there are some cool resources online where you can look at the Traveler universe and how you can see how small known space is compared to the rest of the Milky Way galaxy. So there are, um, you know, there are psionics. There's different levels of technology. That's a big thing. You know, you can have some, you can go to worlds where um, tech level is limited to primitive weapons and, and medieval type technology where you have some super hi-fi plasma weapons. Um, starships, worlds, you know, can be barren planetoids to gas giant moons, right? So... And the setting, right, there is a, uh, that I just kind of explained it. And there is actually this sort of, the hypothesis that is out there that scholastics might know is that why are all these races out here in this little arm of the Milky Way galaxy? And that is as ascribed to a, a race called the Ancients, who in the distant past uh, transported humans and Terran wolves, among other things, and transplanted them to other worlds and undertook many megascale engineering products before destroying their civilization, civilization in a catastrophic civil war. And some um, adventures kind of highlight finding ancient ruins and things like that with super duper, almost magical type technology. So, so there you go, that's Traveler in a nutshell. Jason, I don't know if that helps you at all. Ask questions, man, and remember your character Maybe you feel like as a player you need to know everything, but your character doesn't really, and it's all this immersive play, right? I mean, do you know or care about all the gods in the world, the world surrounding Fomalhalt in our DCC fantasy game? Probably not. So um, maybe hopefully uh, you won't kill yourself over it so much and just play games, right? Where if we played a game like Seven Seas, or we played any other pirate game with fantastical elements, but that use England and Spain and France, you, you know, then I don't have to relearn the world history. So it's less work. And yes, this is me whining. This is me being a lazy player, without a doubt. But I only have so many hours in the day. And if it's interesting to me, then I'm going to read it for fun. But if it's not overly interesting to me, then it becomes a chore to do that research. So I'm not putting down any of your games, although Maddie might be. Maddie's quite annoyed right now. Maddie doesn't like Seven Seas, apparently. But seriously, I'm not putting down anything. I'm just explaining an honest answer of my feelings, which is probably a mistake, and I hope it's not misconstrued. But, but that's my honest answer to your query. Jason Chumba. Maybe the world of Thera is not Earth. Maybe it's some planet circling some sun somewhere else. Why then are humans there? I don't know. Would characters that you create know that? No, they just know their history of Thera. And I don't even know I don't even know if there's an ancient history of Thera. That's what's interesting. I should check that out and find out. I don't even know. Maybe it's somewhere in some supplement from before or now. Maybe it doesn't matter. But my hypothesis is that 
it's not Earth. That's why you have, you know, the golden age of piracy, along with the conquista, along with the equivalent of the Hundred Years' War, Thirty Years' War, not Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, um, all at once, along with the apparently the rise of Islam and colonization and exploration of Africa. So uh, there you go. It's a big amalgamation for some reason. Maybe I would suggest reading how I would get my inspiration for a game on Thera. Maybe. Not directly. Not nearly as directly, but maybe a... Um, yeah, inspiration is probably the best word. Jerry Pornell's Janissaries? Hmm. Could that be it? I don't know. Okay, Chumba. I finished out your latest episode. Of course, the song is from Death Clock. That you, you're like a broken record, man. You always play Death Clock. But I'm curious, and I guess what we'll to play the game more to find out. But is the Laughing Man more Randall Flagg in deference to Joe Richter joining your campaign? Or is it more good old gnarly tip? I, I guess, because, well, Deadlands isn't really Cthulhu, though. But I guess there's nothing keeping you from putting old, good old gnarly tep in there. I don't know. I, I guess we'll have to play to find out, won't we? Talk to you later. Hey, sorry I haven't thrown down some snippets of song lately. Just haven't felt up to it. Um, even right now, I have a headache on the right side of my head. But, uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, the answer is neither. It is neither Randall Flagg or Nero Lothotep, even though some scholars, like Stephen King, believe that Randall Flagg, Randall Flagg and Nirlathotep are incarnations of the same entity. Or Randall Flagg is an aspect of Nirlathotep, I guess. I read that somewhere on some internet page. Or was it in an interview with Stephen King? I don't know. But you know what? The Laughing Man is not either of those. So, there. Ha! But hey, thank you, Jason. I think what you just did is a great example of what uh, Jason Hobbs is talking about when he says blue booking, right, is we continue to share ideas and share our thoughts about a game in between adventures and sessions and try to develop the world. So you're speculating on who is this nefarious character who caused trouble in Flat Edge, Kansas, to make it cause it cause chaos and make it burn to the ground with demonic summonings and killings of lots of people and disrupting right the Empire rail lines and some local uh, cattle trade. Hmm. So there's multiple layers on what's going on, and I'm glad that you're speculating about it. I hope other players like Joe Richter and Arlen Walker are as well, and then our other player who I will have to ask permission if he wants to be named. Of course, if he were to call in and leave a leave some information or leave a speculation or leave any sort of post on this podcast, he might get a Benny. Well, anyone might get a Benny, right? I guess that's a thing now, thanks to Amy. But uh, yeah, thanks for calling in and uh, very cool stuff. I'm glad that my silly little games and attempt at uh, putting down something fun and cool is making other people think about those ramifications. Yeah, I mean, in the last, you probably heard uh, Joe Richter's questions, like what was going on there in Flat Edge, Kansas? Again, you know, that's part of the mystery and part of the contribution that makes role-playing games so cool is like a memorable game will promote that type of thought. So uh, let's keep keep at it, man. It's, uh, it's very interesting. It gives me ideas because maybe they're not set in stone, right? I have some, like a general outline somewhere written in some spiral notebook somewhere. Uh, but uh, it can change. It can definitely change based on what the players think or don't think. And now, as if summoned, a word from Joe Richter. 
Yo, Carl, thank you so much for your explanation on how damage works in Savage Worlds. If I had just read that and even listening to you explain it to me, I would have been like, wow, that sounds really wonky. But having played it, it, it runs pretty smooth. And that's just one of those examples of why it's good to play these games instead of just read them. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Call of Cthulhu game sounds awesome with Jason and his son. Uh, yeah, he actually sent me a link to the game and was like, yeah, join the game. And I happened to be awake at like 530 in the morning, my time. And it was just like, no, <laughs> early morning RPGs are not for me. Something I've learned about myself. And one last thing in that episode, you mentioned something about um, and I forget the name of the game, but you were trying to find out some information about a game. So you were either talking to the author or watch the author play an actual play. And they were house ruling a bunch of their own game. That sounds weird. Why would you house rule your own game? Make it what you wanted to in the first place. Peace out. Hey, Joe, that was 7th C. That was a game. I watched a YouTube video. I don't know if it was... It was one of the more famous ones. And they had, like, voice actors and things like that. But the when the author ran the game, he noted where he took some variations from the rules as written. And... I agree. That was kind of odd. It didn't help me to get a feel for the game as well as maybe I could have. And like, why do you just highlight the game, man? Highlight the game. Maybe it was, he felt it was too complicated for the players to do what he had intended. I don't know. I really, I, I probably need to watch more examples of 7th C at play to really properly run it. Um, yeah, it's it's a curious system. It's a cool verse, despite what Jason Connerly might say, because I know the secrets of the verse. And yes, I used to get irritated that why don't you just call Germany this Germany sounding place Germany um, or France or whatever? But it's the same yet different for a reason, in my opinion, and based on what I've researched. So uh, you know. Sometimes a player doesn't have to know everything, right? So, um, yeah, but even though Jason hates 7C, he really does like Savage Worlds. And like he said time and time again, it plays better than it than it reads. And I think we see that um, when we're running the game, it flows pretty well. It's generally pretty dynamic. We don't get bogged in, in rules or rules questions, maybe a spot rule here or there. But generally speaking, the flow of the game is pretty tight. So um, that's why I like Savage Worlds, and I hope I can continue to run it. I have um, not. I have a lot of Savage Worlds products actually. I have not just Deadlands, but also you know Rifts, our incarnation of it, and um, a Victoriana or a Victoria like Victorian Age weird incarnation. Um, I have that post-apocalyptic one, two post-apocalyptic ones actually. More of a Mad Max one and more of a Aliens Destroy the World one. And I even have one that would be really fun to do, maybe as a one-shot or a short campaign, like a 1970s, 80s Las Vegas, which uh, could or could not have zombies. Hey, got another unboxing that could be a preview to something that's happening tomorrow. Again, my, wow, my trusty anvil might be a little rusted, but I got a package here. It's a envelope pa bubble wrap package from Portland, Oregon. Does it have an easy opening? No, I think I have to use my box cover. I like, I prefer easy open, right? Sometimes you feel like a box, a, cut, a cutter or a knife. Might damage the product inside. Well, the good thing is that it's packaged well. It's uh, got a cardboard inside as a backing. Likely, I will put it in a magazine sized plastic cover. And what is it? It is a Bear's Den. Yes, it is the. Um, I think it's the third book that I'm missing from the trilogy. I think it's called the Return to Warsaw Trilogy. Um, 
So let's see, what does it have? The bear's den is pretty cool. It's got that. It's got a really cool. I, it's got a really cool Holloway, uh, Jim Holloway cover of uh, guys fighting in the snow on skis. Hmm. Cool. Uh, the cover says, "You and a band of Ukrainian freedom fighters are all that stands in the way of the schemes of power of a power mad dictator." Yes, it's part of the Return to Europe trilogy that they did. Adventure in the Icy Steps of the Soviet Union with Bear's Den. So I guess it does have, you know, Southern Soviet Union stuff. Information on winter equipment. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, operation instructions for different types of vehicles. Kind of neat. Winter assault. Ooh, pretty compelling. I don't want to give any spoilers. But it's, it's nice. It's in good shape. Most of the things are in good good shape. It smells being a little old. But, uh, you know, these... This was made in, what, 1989, so that's not so bad. It's going to be a little yellowed, but everything is in good condition. No rips or tears, no big stains, cool maps as usual. I really like the simplicity in the maps and map design that they had in, in this series of, of things. So, uh, yeah, pretty neat. So, I guess it, that's a switch, right? You know, there's this sort of epic in Twilight 2000... And, I mean, we're still in the first phase in my Twilight 2000 game, uh, the breakout phase. I just taking it as slow as possible and let the players explore, right? Um, the idea is to get to Krakow, and I think the uh, the Krakow part will be like the second phase of the adventure. And then from there, they can, you know, go home or stay in Poland. Um, I have ideas for adventures back in the States or adventures like this Return to Warsaw thing, or the Warsaw uh, series, I guess it'd be Pirates of the Vistula, uh, the Ruins of Warsaw, Black Madonna, uh, other things too, right? So I have a lot of supplements for Twilight 2000, but we'll see what direction that these folks go. But I'm expanding my collection. Well, they didn't fight the tank. In fact, they ran from the tank. But it's kind of cool how they did it. Our convoy... Of survivors they had just rescued a group of american pow's a quarter of which were infected or sick with typhoid and had gotten out of the town picked up their their buddies uh heard that another conflict was happening in the woods with the others of their crew uh and they were successful but one got injured so they kind of met and that's where we kind of picked it up as they were met in the, you know, driving through the woods, they heard the, uh, the diesel chug of the tank start up and uh, they were going to try to avoid it. So I was kind of concerned about this because I had, I got put the tank like on the roll 20. I looked up, you know, vehicle combat. I saw what could happen if the tank got lucky and hit, it would not be good for the APC, which was the strongest vehicle that these this crew of survivors had. It just would have torn through the APC. One shell would have torn through the APC, plus the tank. It's a T, it was a T-72 main battle tank. It They had nothing that could penetrate the armor. If they got lucky, maybe the 50 cal could do something from behind. But the tank, being a main battle tank, had IR spotlight, fire control solution system, um, it had a coaxial machine gun as well as a pinto mounted machine gun. And they probably had, a, they had another guy on a gun as well. Um, so it would have been bad news, but our heroes are savvy. They had gotten radios from the Soviet soldiers that they had taken out. And between Jonesy and Kasha, they kind of spoofed them. They spoofed the tank that they were going in one direction and that they were marauders and they had successfully taken these prisoners um, to use for their own whatever and now they're going to trap the tank so they went in one direction the tank went in the other and they never had to face it i guess i was cool i mean i had prep for it like i said i made a battle map and i had the tank ready to go but characters can be savvy and they go in different directions and that was good because even with as many minuses as I could figure out. If I had two dice, one of which would have been a D10 or a D8, 
one of which would have been a D6, there's still like a 3 in 14 chance that that APC would have gotten hit and it would have been, like I said, destroyed. So uh, good for them. They escaped um, to live another day. So the heroes took off into the forest. They went east by southeast. They had radioed ahead, since they all have radios, which is great. They radioed ahead to the APC to break camp and meet them in the woods or on the road. They coordinated pretty well. Um, they had a, one had one of the vehicles that they have had a mishap, so their convoy has three vehicles now: an APC, a Gas 66, which has been converted to an ambulance, and a pickup truck. Actually, technically, they have four vehicles because they also have a motorcycle. So it's a pretty cool convoy. The only mishap was that the truck kind of overheated, so they had to stop, and that's where they kind of camped overnight since uh, radio chatter suggested that uh, the tank had gone sort of northwest towards a town where they knew were a bunch of Soviet deserters. So uh, good luck with that. We'll see what happens with the tank crew and, and all that. I don't even, I might, I don't know if I'd play it out. It might be fun to play it out and see what happens. Um, and maybe the notorious tank crew of Captain Ilvanovich will be back. Who knows? If they survive, they might be destroyed by a, a group of 50 uh, Soviet deserters who may or may not have anti-tank weapons. Mm. Who knows? So the heroes camped. Um, they, did, they, they kind of stopped, did some foraging, uh, did some distilling to make some fuel. I really, I didn't, I did two things. I only kind of kept track of the fuel of the uh, APC since that's the biggest guzzler and the other uh, vehicles had plenty of fuel and weren't as gas consumptive heavy. The gas 66 sort of is, but not really. And the truck and the motorcycle really don't burn a lot of fuel compared to the, the tank uh, cons tanks that they have. So it's just the APC is such a guzzler. And it, and I know that some of the players had had designs on getting the tank, but um, it probably it would have also been a massive gas guzzler. And it hadn't been converted; it's still using diesel fuel. So, um, of course, it does have a 1,200 capacity. So I don't know. Who knows? Um, anyway, they camped. Then they continued. Uh, they found a, a road. They went a little bit on the road, but then crossed over. They're really trying to avoid villages and, and encounters along the road. As fuel is inefficient as it is, um, it just seems a safer course, which is great. And uh, they camped, did some more foraging, found some more fuel. So they, they kind of drive like one shift, and then they forage and, and do other things on another shift. Uh, it, my wife's character, Kasha, is tending to the sick and wounded. She actually healed up Jonesy, which was kind of cool, who had gotten shot. And she's been treating the wounded with antibiotics that they have stolen from the Soviets, courtesy of the Gaz 66. I mean, they have a full ambulance, which is really nice. So um, as they were traveling north on the road that day, they found an, the remains of another ambush. And this was a story hook that I had thrown in so they could get to Krakow. And it involves something called Operation Reset, which, um, am I going to spoil it? Yeah, I'll spoil it a little bit. So Operation Reset is an operation uh, taken on by U.S. Special Forces to try to find some, some plans for something kind of cool that could help jumpstart society since everything got, you know, blown up to shit with nuclear weapons in this verse. So they came upon this convoy that got shot up. Everything was taken it looked like it had been a pre-planned ambush uh, based on their observations from hit from both sides of the road. The Humvees looked like Swiss cheese. Uh, it looked like one Jeep tried to escape but was caught, and the people were pulled out of the Jeep and shot up. Um, but they found a survivor, a Lieutenant Schaefer, and Schaefer gave them a name, a name of the person who had set up the ambush and told them, find the papers, find the papers. So they looked through all, you know, some, they had, these marauders, whoever hit this convoy, had really torn it up and taken anything worth salvaging. Although one of the players did find a half a pack of smokes. So not everything useful was taken, right? So it was kind of fun. There's like a big percentile table and one of the players likes to scrounge around and see what he can find. 
so uh, this adventure he's found a pack of smokes a microwave and a trombone so uh, there you go i think they found a boat one time they found some other things but um anyway so they they find this intel about operation reset uh, it's plans for something kind of cool uh diaz the npc and kasha translate it and then they're like we got to get to krakow so that's where they're headed now um they want to give this to uh some agency who knows what country there's definitely things that some of the players aren't telling and one of the players did comment typical typical spook on one of the players who said who kind of told stuff but is hiding stuff but said you know did promise i'm not trying to screw you you know i'm with you guys i will not stab you in the back but i can't tell you everything so so they continue on their journey towards Krakow now. Now they have a plan. They do sort of partially on-road, partially off-road uh, camp forage. Um, when they're at one camp spot, they do see someone observing their camp, and they try to sneak up on them, but it doesn't quite work. Uh, they sort of give chase, but the sniper in their group, uh, Master Chief Tops, takes them out. Uh, they recover a rifle. The person was wearing a patch with an ace of spades on it that said, um, long live the king. They don't know what that means. I kind of do, but they didn't really explore it. They kept going. So one key thing to do in Twilight 2000 is to keep going. You don't want to start establishing a camp and be static because then you can, you'll, you'll run afoul of things. Things will just wander into you, around you. It's just kind of um, a law of averages that... Uh, if you stay in one place, something's going to happen. So it's better to keep a move on. So they did, uh, and they also, it was kind of neat, they also mapped it out because we have a map, and they figured out that it, it really wasn't that bad a difference if they could fill up going off-road um, versus going on the road. The The benefit of going on the road, you use, you use yet less fuel, but you're traveling more, right? It's going through a mountain pass and over and then down the valley where Krakow exists. But if they kind of go off-road through a pass that they kind of scoped through the mountains here that they're going through, they could camp out in a valley, refuel up, and then get to Krakow, not necessarily on the road. Who knows? I mean, Krakow's probably fortified, so they might have to get on the road at some point. But at least they won't have to go through these villages, and they can camp out and maybe hike over the mountains and explore some of these a village that's nearby if they want to, but they don't have to. So that's kind of where we stayed. It was a lot. They moved 90 kilometers uh, in this particular session, which is great. They're making progress. They kind of broke out of a tough situation and did not get blown up by the tank. So that's the Twilight 2000 recap. We've been really having fun. Again, a lot of procedural. Um, I did, a, I guess to explain the procedural, what they would do is you can look for and gather uh, consumables to be used for the dis for the dis for the distillery, the still I should call it the still to make fuel, and you can also forage for food. So when but they have all these all the the rescued Amer uh, ex prisoners that they have, they kind of broke them up into two groups, and some were supervised by the players to go gather materials for the still, and others went out foraging for food. Uh, they, they, oh, another thing that they did do when they did take off from the town where they found the tank, a Dobroz, Dobrozian, uh, they did capture a um, Polish doctor, and they were kind enough to drive him a little bit back to town, and that went off without a hitch. Um, there was no encounters, which could have been a problem, but uh, one of the players drove him out on the motorcycle back to town and let him go. They still have one prisoner who is this alleged cannibal and they haven't figured out what to do with this person. I don't know why they keep 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 him, but uh, oh well. So um, they've also collected some good gear. They've collected I think it was three AK-74s and a couple AKMs with some ammo. So it's pretty good that they've been able to um, to get this kind of quote-unquote loot. So um, that's where they're at. We are keeping track of fuel and food as uh, with some 
I think, pressure and concern. But I don't want to get too much into the minutia. I did learn something, though. I know there's been some complaints here and again about using Roll20 and revealing too much. One player made a comment about that. Oh, look, something's attacking us. This is what it is, which kind of irritated me. But now I know I can, I can look on my tables and just roll off camera, roll real dice off camera, um, and it won't be as much of a spoiler. It's just very helpful sometimes to roll on the roll 20. And I have, you know, like I have Marauders, Soviet troops, Polish troops as air characters and NPCs, and I can modify them as I need. But if it's going to spoil what's attacking you, well, I guess I can't do that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, some people don't care about that. Some people get really bothered by that. Some people make fun of it. So it's something that I probably have to monitor and watch. Anyway, uh, that was it was a good Twilight 2000 session. Again, they did make a lot of progress. They did make 90 kilometers as the crow flies from their campsite that they started at at the beginning of the session. And they're about 50 to 60 kilometers away, like one good session of driving, one good shift of driving away from Krakow. So they're, they might hold off here for a little bit, fill up the, the truck, you know, fill it with fuel, do some still, distilling. Hopefully nothing wanders into their camp or nearby their camp. And uh, then get to Krakow where we will start the second phase of the campaign. So I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, it's going to be a different not traveling around and trying to survive, but doing some sort of uh, intrigue and sort of noir style uh, play um, with modern weapons, of course. Well, that's all for now. It's getting on to close to an hour of talking. And we've had some, I think, good discussion, very interesting questions and comments and hopefully rebuttals that you might find interesting and could prompt you to call in. Hey, if you call in here, you'll be famous to about, you know, the few listeners that I do have, but uh, it helps with a great discussion and helps me to promote and play better games with my group and various groups that I have. So uh, the rest of this, oh yeah, and I guess if we're playing a Savage World game, you'll get bennies for it. So um, I'll talk to you next time. This week I still have my Warhammer Fantasy role play game that is live. So um, that should be pretty fun. We'll see how that goes.